or science or discipline, whatever course you want to sign up for, um, to, depending on what subject matter you want to study. Well, let's say I'm going to study um, morals, how humans are supposed to act. Ethics. Ethics, yeah, it's a science of ethics. And we as Christians have a certain world view where we subscribe to, let's say, we could fit that into this paradigm, Christian ethics. Obviously probably very diametrically opposed to um, secular, the world's ethics, right? And it's unfortunate, I even see this at Azusa. I have to spend usually the first week or so going over with my students um, getting them out of relativism. Um, and relativism has just, it's, it's so prevalent. Um, I don't know if, you, if Nick's gone over this, but relativism's in the media, it's on all the TV. I mean, it's everywhere. Everything that, you know, all over the internet, and we're bombarded, we're raised in a culture of relativism, and it's probably no wonder that it's even crept into the church. And so, obviously, if I'm going to be teaching a philosophy class, um, I'm going to want to basically know, hey, are we going to be able to learn anything at all, or is it just a matter of opinions? Because if it is, I'd rather be at home watching TV. I know everybody else probably would. Um, one father, this is a famous line, says, I don't send my son to university to learn what the professor thinks. I send them, my son, to university to know the truth, to learn what the professor is supposed to teach, be a guide. You don't learn what the professor thinks, you learn what's actually true. So, as far as truth goes, By the way, has anybody ever heard of, um, I remember when I was studying for the SAT and then later on the GRE, which is the graduate entrance exam, um, they'd have these different things, these study methods that they would teach you. Um, and one of the things they would give, they'd give an a acronym for PO. Now that's not PO boy, <laughs> PO me. Um, that stands for process of elimination. I'm going to see if I have another marker. <laughs> I have a sharpie that would say that. I know. <laughs> Use this device. It's so helpful in critical thinking and figuring out conclusions. Yeah. Um, Boil something down to as few options as possible. Okay? Okay. It's just like when Nick's taught you, oh, thank you, oh, bless you, with the um, logic. Hey, look, either this is an eraser or it's not. Okay? Clearly, that's not, not an eraser. So, it has to, by process of elimination, it has to be what? My parents used to do this on me. Here's how you do it faulty, okay? I said try to limit it as a few options as possible, right? It's either A or B. If you can get it down to two, great. Sometimes it's it's three. But you may have to make sure what's that? You just said the first the first um word that you use is process of elimination. Yeah. Process of elimination. So a process of elimination. Narrow whatever situation you're thinking of, um, uh, something that you're working with, narrow it down to as few possibilities as possible. If you can get it down to two, that's the best. Either it's an eraser or it's not. It's not, not an eraser, so it has to be an eraser. That would be a process. Um, ways that that can fail? My parents were notorious for doing this. 
Well, the dishes are out here and they weren't put away. Now, your mother and father, we weren't in the house. And it certainly didn't crawl out of the dishwasher and put it them. So it had to be you. Okay, process of elimination, they must be right. Problem is, this is why I say ways it can go wrong, I have a little brother. <laughs> so you have to make sure that, okay, maybe you want to group that into, okay, C stands for siblings. Okay. But make sure you cover your bases. So when I say narrow it down to as few options as possible, you have to make sure that you got everything in that possible category, okay? Now why do I bring that process of elimination up? Yes. Because it's important with regards to when we're talking about truth. Okay. As far as I've been able to tell and other thinkers, unless you know any other there's only three candidates for the idea of truth. Okay, three worldviews. Now this is important because again, we want to know specifically with ethics, moral truths, right? Is um, should one is this a truly the way one should behave? Should you do this? Should you avoid that? Is that wrong? Um, well, we need to look at what the Christian worldview is, and we're going to contrast that with all of the other possible worldviews, and by process of elimination, see what's the only contender, right? I can only think of three. If anybody can think of any other ones, let me know. One, subjectivism. Two, this pen is fantastic. Gift <laughs> from God. Relativism. Free. Objectivism. Um, we'll start with one and two. And what I want you to notice is in those words, before you give me what those ideologies are, What word is in subject? Yeah. Um, and that's just if you think back on our school days in high school and junior high, grammar school. Um, remember subject, object, predicate? Yeah. Okay, subject, that refers to people, right? A person. Um, when it comes to truth, particularly moral truths, I contend, as um, many others do, unless you can think of any other possibility, there's only three worldviews out there. Subjectivism, it says truth and moral truths are subjective. They're relative to the subject. That's where you get what's true for me is true for me, what's true for you is true. Truth is relative to the person, the subject, the individual person. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. It's so funny you brought that up. That's exactly what my class was on Friday. <laughs> and we're going over Plato who was arguing beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. And the students did not like that. And it's because of these ideas of subjectives and relatives are so prevalent. And maybe we'll get into that. But so yeah, your truth is your truth. Um, it's opinion, right? Your opinion. It's all perspective, okay? Um, don't. The, it, it's always headed under the guise of tolerant, right? Be more tolerant. But being so intolerant, right? Everybody has their own view. Don't push your. Everybody sees things the way they see it, okay? That would be subjectivism. Relativisms, maybe you don't want to go so extreme. 
and say, well, I don't want to say that truth's relative to the way you see it as an individual, and each one has their, but truth's defined relative to a group or a society. So that's where you would get things like, look, our laws tells us what's right or wrong. Um, that's determined by the group and society and culture that we live in. Yeah, um, marriage is legal, therefore it must be okay. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, it probably starts off fairly naive where you think, well, look, um, look how we're all dressed. We're not running around like... Um, the natives in Africa naked and everything, and uh, you know, it would be wrong for us to expect people to do that, just as it would be wrong for us to impose in their culture, saying, well look, even though you live out in the jungle somewhere and there's no people and you have this whole to put clothes on. So then they go, well look, they make that, that's fair enough. We could probably all say, like, look, okay, yeah, I can understand that the natives out in the middle of the Amazon running around naked and that that's something relative to there. But then it makes a jump to say, look, all of the things that we believe, you're brought up with your religion, your laws of, you know, you certainly wouldn't apply American laws over in Norway and Denmark and say, look, you have to do, because truth is relative to the society and group, it's defined that way, okay? Um, the third one would be objectivism, and like the word you see in there, object, right? That's not dependent. It's a clear denial that truth is relative to a group or a subject. Now, it's not saying that everything is objective, okay? For example, if I said, hamburger is the best tasting food in the world, is that... That's objective, wrong. relative, or subjective? That's just wrong. <laughs> or wrong. Yes. Or is it objectively wrong? <laughs> it's just wrong? Well, there I'm making a clear claim about my personal preference, right? Um, that would be something that is subjective, okay? So objectivism allows for certain things to be objective, but it says, no, truth is. The nature of truth is objective, okay? And what you're going to find, objectivism says, this is false and this ideology is false. There are things that are objectively true. And that goes from, instead of dealing, for example, let's say this is the Earth. The Earth has a sun. Is that my opinion? Now, notice it makes no reference to any people. There doesn't even have to be any people on Earth to make that claim for that to be true. The Earth has a sun. Notice because it's dealing with two objects, isn't it? And that's where the notion of objective comes in. Usually you get subjectivism um, tied in with this grammatical device that we've probably all heard of, first person point of view. Objectivism is called third person point of view. This is what we would call in grammar singular, and this would be plural. What do you think is the significance? Well, the, the first are changeable. You know, even society is continually changing. Our opinions are continually changing. What's right or wrong is going to be. But what do you think changing. the significance of the fact that this is singular versus this is being plural? When we say objective means third person plural. Well, who's the third person? Truth exists outside of you. Yeah, so when I say the hamburger is the bed, okay, that's something that's true. Well, no other third person, you can't come and see how the hamburger tastes the way I taste it, okay? 
But what about this claim? The earth has a sun. Here I am up here saying that. The earth has a sun. Okay. Now I may be the only person in the world that may seem subjective. But what if it's not first person? What if another person comes and observes and says, I can confirm that. The earth does have a sun. And another person, another person. Well, that's the notion of objectivity, right? So that's why we would say things like taste, personal preferences, like should I wear red or blue? Yes, that would be a first person preference. Um, that's not something really anybody else has access but yourself. But objective things, if that's true, anybody else should be able to go and say, look, reality. It's reality. Yeah, exactly. Reality is objective. Okay. Um, now, again, we're going to do the process of elimination. What I tell my students is both of these state there is no objective truth. And then I just ask them to say, to look at that statement and say, does anything just grammatically look strange about that statement? Subjectivism and relativism are two worldviews that state there okay. is no objective truth. So is that true? Yeah. It's not, it's not, uh, there's not a subjective statement. Yeah. When I say something, right, when I say, Hey, let's go. There's a moon outside. Let's go look, okay? I say something out loud. I verbally express it when it's not my opinion, right? When I really believe there's something out there that you can go. Now, if that was just something, it was my personal, I wouldn't say it, right? So we've got an inconsistency here. You can ask the person that says, there are no objective truths. That is that supposed to apply to me, or is that just your subjective, or is that a relative truth? If it is, I'm not really sure why you even said that. So, no, no, that's true for everybody. Well, you just said there's no objective truths, right? Well, that's the one objective truth. Well, <laughs> then that statement's not true. Right? It's self-contradictory. So what we have, never accept a contradiction. So it's real easy. Those are out. And what we find, if this is false, there, when we say there is no objective truth is false, then the conversion is there are some objective truths. The first one would just be there are some. There's one. Or even prior to that, there's self-contradiction, right? There's no objective truth. It's objectively, well, there's one. And if there's one, then my statement that there's one is true. And then my statement about that is true. So. Now I have like whole hope of, and we can get into other things to see that are objectively true. But that's just an easy way. Look, I don't see any other way worldview to put out there. Either truth is just your individual opinion. The way you see it, and that's different from the way you see it. You see it. Or it's our society that has to define it. Okay. But we already experienced a problem with that. In the Nuremberg trials, they had to face up to this. There's a great video on this. What was it the SS officers? Because this is, my students always want to know what's, I don't get all this logical stuff. Why is this relevant? It's relevant because of events like this. The atrocities that the Nazis did and we're putting together for the first time. We've never had any precedents like this before. So you can't, Usually in the courts, what do we do? You can cite precedent, right? Um, Smith versus California, okay. Well, this is the first international court. You can't say, well, international court, or can't. 
How do you condemn the SS, the Nazi um, SS officers? They were seeing this. What do you mean we're wrong? We were following our laws. We would have been shot if. How can you come and tell American law, the UK law, on us in Germany? This is our law. We were following orders. So they realized, oh, that's not going to work. Okay, this isn't. So what do you think that the, the prosecution, they brought the highest, the best of the best lawyers out. And they didn't know what to do. They were like, we can't do, call out court precedents, right? Or legal precedents, I mean. Um, they do have a point there that is their law. So, but we have something in our heart telling us that's just wrong. Well, how is it wrong? What do you think they appealed to? Not your law. Yeah. They accepted this to be true. And what they worked out is a thing called natural law. Natural law was developed by Tom, um, most meticulously um, by Thomas Aquinas, um, a Catholic, a Roman Catholic uh, philosopher and theologian um, in the 1500s. And that is the idea that truth in nature, that's reality in which we, things have natures, the way they truly are, okay? Tables are hard, that's the nature, the nature of a tree is to grow and produce fruits. Well, the nature of us is to preserve and care for life. The sanctity of, we're the one creature in the universe that God's creation that's been endowed with reason that protects the innocent and the one thing is the preservation of life to act against that is an ultimate violation of a natural law and you can only say that if there's something objectively true that you don't define it would be something that you discover and so that's the way that they got out of And this is tying back to Christian ethics. As Christians as a worldview, we hold to this. We deny subjectivism and relativism. Natural law, Thomas Aquinas worked this out. He says there's three states of law. Man's law. Okay. So we have all kinds of tax codes and um, California laws and you know certain street laws and okay that's man's law Aquinas says then there's natural law it's like the law of God's created universe the way things look if an orange tree's nature is to grow and blossom and produce fruit and multiply each according to its kind, right? Genesis says. Um, and oranges, and then it reproduces through that. What if it doesn't, but it's all stunted and retarded, and it doesn't produce oranges? What do you say? It doesn't fulfill its nature. Okay? Is it ethically, morally wrong for doing that? No, it doesn't have free will, right? It can't... It can't do, it's not like, huh, I could go the straight and narrow and produce what my family wants me to do, nice oranges, offspring. But I decide I'm going to go the nasty route and dry up and you know, nature doesn't have those. The only creatures that have that are those endowed with reason. The imago Dei, the image of God, that's us. We have the choice to whether we want to go against our nature. And that's where ethics comes in. Because we have that choice. So it's a twofold thing. Yes, right and wrong does have to, in the sense of um, nature, it has to do with 
fulfilling one's nature. We studied that this week. Did you tell us? Tell no, no, no? It's, it was our, our chapters this week in the ethics before on infanticide and euthanasia. Oh, great. This, what you're talking about, is exactly what we're studying. If an infant, for instance, is born severely handicapped, then it cannot fulfill its natural purpose. You know, it's not going to grow, it's not going to yeah. go to school and so forth. Is it still a person? Yeah. Does it still have person? Hold on to that. I think that's a great. Um, so it's nine o'clock. We right nine. We could actually transition into philosophy because I think Aristotle provides a great answer. And Aristotle sowed the seeds of natural law because Thomas Aquinas was basically Aristotle on steroids. That's the way. Yeah. So let's bring that up. Yeah. Um, would a fourth Possession be dialectism, theism, where they believe that contradictions can be true. Just, I don't know how new it is or when they started, but it views that some statements can both be true and false simultaneously. Yeah, it, it, that, that stems from something called fuzzy logic. Um, it's kind of complicated, but let me just put it in false at the same time. Yeah. Here's a great, we can put that up as a fourth possibility. I'll give you a quick it's argument. It's not a formal logic, it says, but it is a system of thought that is being propagated. So. It's called fuzzy logic. <laughs> it's a funny <laughs> Um I'll just give you a quick argument to refute that. So we could put that up as a fourth option in which we could eliminate through a process of elimination. So Nick gave you the three fundamental laws of logic, right? Which fuzzy logic would deny. Okay, That's the law of identity. A equals A. So that um, that establishes meaning. So that any time that you see the word pen or hear the word well, you know that tomorrow when somebody's like, hey, grab a pen, you're like, oh, that's the same thing.